good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. We're so happy that you could join us. Uh, my name is Charlie Heaps and I'm a researcher at SEI, the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I'm also the lead developer of LEAP. Uh, we have a really packed program for you today. We're going to be demonstrating the new features or some of the new features of the brand new 2020 version of LEAP. Uh, LEAP is a software tool developed at SEI that is widely used around the world for integrated planning of energy policy, climate change mitigation, and air pollution abatement. LEAP helps its users to explore alternative energy development pathways and assess their implications in terms of energy use, emissions, economic costs and benefits, and health and ecosystem impacts. LEAP is notable for being a complete uh, decision support system, not just a modeling tool. Uh, it also emphasizes key tasks such as data management, results visualization, documentation, and stakeholder engagement. Um, I want to emphasize that today's webinar will not be a tutorial. Um, while LEAP is known for its ease of use, uh, it still takes some time to get really comfortable with it. Um, Obviously, the current pandemic is making travel impossible right now, just at the time when countries are working hard on the next round of their climate commitments, their NDCs. But uh, the pandemic is making travel impossible right now and conducting in-training, uh, in-person in trainings impossible. Uh, so we at SEI have been developing other ways of building capacity, uh, including creating new distance learning training materials and conducting remote assistance through Zoom and other platforms. So please reach out to me uh, by email um, if you're interested in getting training or if you want to know more about how we can help you with capacity building. So again, just for today, we won't be doing uh, training. We'll be focusing on showing you the uh, brand new features in LEAP 2020. Uh, and particularly, we're going to focus on a very exciting new development uh, of a brand new optimization framework called NEMO that's been developed by my colleague, Jason Basie. Um, so there's a lot to get through today. Um, and I'm delighted, therefore, I couldn't do all this on my own. So I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Jason and Silvio Ujoa. Jason is the developer of Nemo, which you'll be seeing shortly, and Sylvia is one of our main developers and elite trainers. Um, before we get started, uh, let me go through um, just a, cu a couple of issues, a couple of sort of frequently asked questions about Leap. First of all, uh, when will it be available? Um, well, both Leap and Nemo, which you'll hear about in a minute, will, uh, are, will be available this week. Um, in fact, Nemo, uh, Nemo is already available now. They'll both be available from the Leap website, www.energycommunity.org. Um, questions about compatibility, uh, if you've already been using Leap in the past. Um, this new version is, is fully backwards compatible with earlier versions. It will, uh, first time you use it, it will automatically update your older data sets to the new file format used by Leap 2020. Um, hardware and software requirements. Um, Leap will run on pretty much any standard Windows-based computer. Uh, the minimum RAM requirements are two gigabytes. There is a 32-bit and a 64-bit version. You can use either of those. Um, Leap is designed for Windows only. You can use it on an Apple Mac, but that requires using a virtual machine environments such as Parallels or VMware Fusion. It doesn't run natively on an Apple Mac. Um, will you need a new license to use Leap? Um, no, you won't. <laughs> um, you can continue to use your existing licenses and there is no charge to upgrade from the older version of the software to the new version of the software. Um, if you have an existing license, that is. So just in terms of how Leap licensing works, um, I should emphasize that Leap is not open source software. Um, users do require a license, uh, but the good news is that li those licenses are free for students and they're free for governments, nonprofits, and academics in low income and lower middle income countries. And also there's substantially discounted uh, licenses available in upper middle income countries. Now, finally, let me just say a word about the new name. You may have 
notice that we've changed the name slightly. The older name was the Long Range Energy Alternatives Planning System, but we've decided to keep the acronym <laughs> conveniently, uh, but change the long name to become the Low Emissions Analysis Platform. And that really reflects both um, a broad, the broader scope of the tool as it's been evolving over the years. It's not just for energy policy anymore. It's really for thinking about um, uh, low emissions and development strategies as well. Um, and I think it also reflects the urgency of finding new development pathways that achieve low levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So just a few thoughts there. Um, now let me move on and talk a little bit about the agenda for today. Um, so I've already done my introduction, um, well, then we're going to have a few different talks. I think hopefully you'll find them quite interesting. Um, first of all, my colleague Jason is going to introduce this brand new optimization framework called NEMO. Then I will be doing a short demonstration showing how NEMO is integrated into LEAP and how you can make use of that along with some of the other new capabilities of LEAP 2020 that allow for much more flexible time slicing and allow for modeling of energy storage and how you can use all those things together to start thinking about um, scenarios that really can help achieve um, very low, um, low emissions uh, in, uh, in the future. Then my colleague Sylvia will do a demonstration of two new results visualizations capabilities. Um, marginal abatement cost curves, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, and a new kind of decomposition analysis based on the IPAC methodology. Then I will be doing a demonstration of a new capability in LEAP that allows you to look at um, uh, GIS-based mapping, which uh, as a way of identifying um, uh, the geographic distribution of emissions, uh, but also as a way of sort of looking at potential likely future emissions hotspots. Then we'll have some final remarks and then we'll have some Q&A. Um, we're going to try and keep the overall agenda to uh, about an hour. Please forgive us if we overrun by a, a few minutes because we've got a lot to get through. Um, and let me just say that if for those um, for those who would like to ask questions and answers, you know, we really encourage you to, uh, to, to ask us lots of questions. We got loads yesterday, so I think there will be a lot of questions. Please try and post those in the Q&A section on Zoom. I think that they, they're much more vi visible to everyone if they're in the Q&A section rather than in the chat window. Okay, so let's get started with some of the exciting content. I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Jason now, who's gonna introduce the uh, NEMO optimization framework. Over to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Charlie. As so I'm very, very pleased to be here today and to see all of the folks who've been able to join us. I think as Charlie said, we have a very exciting program to introduce to you these developments in LEAP that have been almost two years in the making. So what I'm going to talk about is a new optimization modeling tool called NEMO, or the Next Energy Modeling System for Optimization, which has also been about two years in development and which we're releasing alongside LEAP 2020. It's designed to work with LEAP 2020. So this tool is a, it's a, a, an open source energy system modeling tool that's been designed from the beginning for high performance. And so unlike LEAP, LEAP is a closed source tool. This tool is open source and you can look at the source code if you want and download it. And it's designed to either work in, in, a, in a command line mode as a standalone application or with LEAP as a graphical user interface. So what we're trying to do with, by attaching it to LEAP is really to bring some additional optimization capabilities within the LEAP framework. We've built NEMO to really with a focus on analyzing critical and emergent questions in contemporary policy. It's been really intended to do things like modeling of grid integration of variable renewable energy, deep decarbonization pathways, analyses of robust energy futures under climate change, and more. We built this tool in, a, in an open source language called Julia, which is a new, new language, really a cutting edge, edge language that's intended for high performance mathematical computing. And we're making it freely available to everybody under an open source license. 
So the reason why we undertook this project with NEMO was to fill a gap in the modeling tools that are available to energy planners, really to be able to provide a, an optimization modeling tool that is affordable, transparent, functionally powerful, and offers good performance. Right now, there are, there are many optimization tools available to energy planners, but nothing that hits this, that fills this niche, fills this, this combination of being able to be freely available, but also have really good performance and a significant range of functionality. Our intent with NEMO and, and by pairing NEMO with LEAP is really to bring substantial optimization capabilities to a broad range of users, all of you in the LEAP community and others, particularly in low and middle income countries, to offer this advanced functionality through an interface LEAP that makes it reasonably usable by people who are not full-time modelers and who haven't spent their career studying optimization tools. And then to go from there to supporting the next generation of sustainable energy analyses with LEAP to help all of you take the next step in your energy analyses to look at questions of high renewables penetration, deep decarbonization, and other relevant questions. As a tool, NEMO offers quite a lot of features right now. We have more that are on the way, which Charlie will talk about toward the end of the webinar. But right now, it's a tool that can be used for full least cost optimization of an entire energy system, supply and demand. It supports modeling of multiple regions and regional trade, energy storage modeling, which is a key capability that we've integrated with LEAP 2020 to allow simulations of energy storage within LEAP. NEMO also supports nodal network simulations of transmission and distribution grids and pipelines. So you can model power flow and pipeline flow within NEMO and you can disaggregate your energy supply and demand modeling over a nodal network and figure out what's happening at each node in the network. It supports emissions and emission constraints, including carbon pricing and the pricing of pollutants as externalities, and those can be taken into account in the cost optimization, as well as renewable energy targets to simulate policies like renewable portfolio standards. We've designed NEMO with parallel processing within it to try to improve the performance and a number of other performance uh, performance tuning options as well. And the parallel processing capabilities allow you to split the work of the, of the construction of the model over multiple processors and even potentially multiple machines really to speed up that part of the model simulation. And with NEMO, we support multiple solvers, both open source solvers and commercial solvers. Fundamentally, NEMO formulates a, a mixed integer linear optimization problem, which does require a separate solver to solve. But we, we at present support five different solvers, including some open source options and some of the big commercial options such as Gurobi and Cplex. And we designed NEMO also to make, the, make it easy to get the data in and out. The data are stored in an open source relational database. It's a, it's a platform called SQLite. So this allows really easy access to the inputs and to the outputs and allows you to use SQL, if you're familiar with that, or tools that leverage SQL to, to manage data for NEMO. So NEMO offers this feature set right now. We've, we've really integrated quite a number of these already with LEAP in LEAP 2020. There are a couple that I've starred here which are coming soon. So within the next several months, I think you can expect to see additional capabilities that within the LEAP user interface that will allow you to leverage some of these features within NEMO. Here's how you can get NEMO now. And now we, we have a site, a GitHub site, where you can view the source code and download the source code if, if you want to do that. But we've also created an installer for NEMO, particularly for using NEMO with LEAP. This installs the tool in a way that's optimized for performance with LEAP. And you can access that through our LEAP website at our download link. And the documentation for NEMO is also all available publicly at this time at the link that I've shown here. Now, I will say some, some people have already asked if this presentation will be shared with participants after the webinar, and it certainly will be. So you'll get these URLs as well. And I'll just also say that when it comes to using NEMO with LEAP, we've really worked hard to make that installation as seamless as possible. All you have to do is to install LEAP 2020, install NEMO, turn LEAP on, and LEAP should recognize where NEMO is and should start to work with it.
I'm going to pass the floor back over to Charlie now, who's going to start taking you through some of the integration that we've done between Nemo and Leap and looking at storage modeling. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so what I'd like to do now then is Jason's sort of given you some of the uh, exciting developments that we've been working on with Nemo. I want to show you how some of those things are integrated into Leap and some of the other changes we've made to Leap 2020 to let you do some uh, interesting new types of modeling that you couldn't do in earlier versions of Leap. Um, so we're going to show you three things mainly. First, how to use the new Nemo tool how to use the new time slicing capabilities in Leap, which are much more flexible than before and much easier to use as well, and how to do NG storage modeling. Um, so in the past, you've been able to use Leap to model overall energy demand and supply, but it was always difficult to, do, to get a really sort of detailed or nuanced picture of how that supply varied within the year <clears throat> to look at sort of seasonal and da daily variations in demand and supply. And, and those issues are really important and they're going to be increasingly important in the future as we start trying to transition to much lower emission development pathways. We're going to need to find ways of integrating uh, much larger amounts of variable renewable power into our grids and how are we going to do that while uh, balancing the, um, the, the seasonal and daily variations in demand. Well, that's probably going to require much more flexible operation of grids and it's going to require energy storage as well. And it's probably going to require energy efficiency uh, on the demand side to make space for sort of growing electrification, which is likely to be a very key strategy for uh, low emission pathways. So for example, if we're going to electrify our transport fleet, we can have to make space for that by doing efficiency in all of the other sectors. Um, so I'm going to give you a little sort of a uh, demonstration of those kinds of things, how you might uh, model them in Leap. I'm going to show you um, a fictitious data set that com covers some of those topics. Uh, so bear in mind that what I show you here is not a real country. These are not real numbers, but a lot of the input data I've used in this ficti fictitious data set is pretty realistic. So I think it's quite interesting. So let's start by looking at some of the data inputs. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do that's maybe different from what you've done when you've used Leap in the past is I'm going to set up my demand analysis in a slightly different way. So the first thing I'm going to do is visit the settings screen in Leap. Um, you won't have seen this screen before. In fact, you will have seen this screen before, but it previously it was called the basic parameters screen. So we've renamed it the settings screen, which is a bit more standard. And I'm going to set up this analysis to do a to, to do the calculations in a di different way. Instead of speci specifying my uh, load shape uh, for the system as a whole, which is what most people typically do in Leap, here I'm going to actually specify the load shapes for each individual demand device. So I'm going to specify how the what lighting looks like, what air conditioning looks like, what refrigerators look like, and I'm going to, I'm going to specify those individually, and then Leap is going to build up the overall system load shape. And that will be important as we look at policies. So if our peak is caused by air conditioning, for example, then we can focus on air conditioning as a really important area to do energy efficiency so that we can flatten the, the peak load and flatten the load shape. And that will really help with um, making sure we can meet our loads in the future. Okay, so that's the first thing I've set up there is load shapes for each demand device. So let's come down now into um, to see how we can actually set up um, the time slices that, that specify the variations within the year. So this is a screen that's been thoroughly redesigned in Leap 2020. Let's go to this time slices screen here under the general time slices screen. Uh, and here you can see I've got a list of time slices. So this is how I've divided my year up. So here I've divided it up into seasons and then within each season I've divided it up into 24 hours. Um, you weren't able to do that in previous versions of Leap. The previous version of Leap couldn't look at um, hourly variations in the bound, but the new one's much more flexible and it's really easy to have different configurations of that. So for example, here under the setup screen, I can set up what kind of um, time slicing I want. There's a really easy to use button here where you can pick whether you want to do seasons, whether you want to do months, whether you want to do weeks. Within that, you can do um, every day of the week, you can do weekdays versus weekends. And then within a, 
particular day, you can divide it up into two, four, or 24 hourly groups. And just selecting one of those will be enough to um, uh, re reconfigure all your time slices in Leap. So I'm not gonna do that now, but it's very easy to do that. You can even configure things in even more detail. For example, if you're in the Middle East, the weekend is a different day than it is here in the US. So you can even configure for example, what's the definition of a weekend? Here we have Saturdays and Sundays, but you could configure it to be Fridays and Saturdays, which is, which is um, how things are done in the Middle East more commonly. Um, okay, so that's the new time slices screen. It's much easier to use and it's much more flexible and much more detailed than before. Okay, so once we've done the setup screen, let's go back and look at how we're specifying our annual energy demands. So here's the demand tree in LEAP, and here we've got a household sector. Here you can see I've divided households down into different end uses. And here you can see for each end use, you'll probably be familiar with this variable where we specify the overall annual energy intensity. But now we have this new variable called load shape, where we can specify how the shape varies within the year. So here there's an equation saying, this is the uh, yearly shape for air conditioning. So let me show you what that's drawing upon is sort of a library of different load shapes, which are specified down here under, under the yearly shape screen. So let me show you that screen quickly. So, oops, sorry, that's a little bit big. So the yearly shape screen is a place where you can build up load shapes of different dev demand devices. So here, for example, you've got air conditioning. Let me show that so you can see the variation by the seasons. So here you can see air conditioning, the peak's obviously gonna be in the US. It's going to be in the summer months during the sort of the middle of the day. Heating is going to be more important in the winter. There's the yellow curve here, much less important in the summer. Lighting, you, as you'd expect, happens in the early hours of the day and in the evening. So whereas refrigerators are a much more sort of flat load shape, there's not that much variation. So you can specify these different load shapes for different devices and then Leap will stack them all up to give you the overall system load shape. And it's really easy, even though there's many, many pieces of data here, it's really easy to import them because you can tend to find hourly load shapes for all 8,760 hours. Those things tend to be available on the internet and you can use the import feature in, in Leap here uh, in order to quickly bring them in. I won't do that now because I don't want to make changes to this data set, but you know, in just a few seconds, you can import and create these different load shapes. So once you've created those load shapes, you can come back down here under your different demand analyses and allocate those load shapes to the appropriate technologies in Leap. So here I've used the air conditioning load shape for the air conditioning technologies the heating load shape for heating technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So the lighting technologies like that. Okay. So that's on the demand side. So what we want to do on the supply side is work out how we're gonna meet those varying demands over time. So let's have a look at our transformation sector now. So down here, I'm gonna close the demand branch, come down here under the transformation branch. And here what we've got is a list of different processes that might be available for meeting those demands. And one thing you can see that's different here compared to the old version of Leap is we have this little battery icon. So what we can do now is specify energy storage. Um, so uh, that was not available in previous version of, um, of Leap, Leap 2018, but energy storage is gonna be there available. It can be charged up when you've got plenty of energy or it can be discharged to help meet the demands in other time slices when you haven't got enough energy. So it can help sort of flatten the overall load shape. Um, so that's a brand new feature in Leap. Um, now, the other thing I want to show you is how you connect Leap up to Nemo. It's really easy to do. Once you've installed uh, Nemo, Leap will automatically see it. You don't have to do anything to manually connect them. Uh, and you can check to see if your, if your version of Leap is connected to Nemo. If I go to the About screen, you can see down here, yes, it's found Nemo. So Nemo is correctly installed. And in order to use Nemo, it's again, very, very, very easy to do. If I just come to the, the module branch, electric generation, 
if I come to uh, one of the scenarios, there's this variable called optimize. So in this case, when you're doing your normal modeling in Leap, uh, your normal simulation modeling, that variable, that variable would just be set to no, just the words no. But in this case, we set it to tell, uh, to tell Leap to use Nemo and to use the CPLEX solver. So as Jason mentioned, Nemo supports all sorts of different solvers. It supports free solvers, which are free, which is great, but they tend to be rather slow. But it also uh, supports what I call these sort of industrial strength solvers. So in particular, at the moment, it supports CPLEX and Groby, which are expensive, but very fast solvers. And we're gonna try and make sure that uh, Nemo, Leap, Nemo and Leap support as many solvers as we possibly can. You have to buy the solvers separately, unfortunately, they're not part of Leap, but at least you have the flexibility to be able to select them. And setting them up is really easy. You know, you just click on this orange button over the right, and here you can select, you know, no to do simulation, yes, just to use um, the default uh, framework and solver, and then here, here are the different solvers you have available. So we do still support the older solver um, that we've used for many years, Osmosis, but we're generally transitioning now to make greater use of Nemo. So in this particular model, I've set up Nemo to use CPLEX. And I will say that if you want to do storage modeling, you do have to use Nemo. We don't support that under CPLEX. Okay, so let's, I'll try and show you some results in, the, in a second, but you can see here I've set this up um, uh, on the supply side to have a range of different technologies. Uh, there's nuclear technologies, there's natural gas, there's wind, there's solar, and there's energy storage. And I'm gonna let Nemo decide which of those technologies to build and how it wants to operate those different technologies. So before I show you some results, let me just quickly show you what scenarios I've set up here. So here we have a baseline scenario. So the baseline scenario is sort of a projection of growth into the future, but it has very few policies. So it doesn't have much energy efficiency. It's not trying to switch away from gasoline transport to electric vehicles. It's not doing very much energy efficiency at all on the demand side. Um, and then, but it's still, it's using Nemo on the supply side to work out um, what kind of electric generation uh, mix it should have. The policies scenario, um, explores really quite sort of rapid introduction of uh, energy efficiency and electrification. So on the one hand, we're trying to do as much energy efficiency as we can. We're switching to efficient lighting, efficient air conditioning. Um, um, there's efficiency going on in the industrial and services sector. And then in, on the transport sector, we're very rapidly switching from gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. So. In both of those scenarios, I'm using, ne using Nemo, but I've, I've blocked Nemo from doing any energy storage in those first two scenarios. So I just want to show what it would look like if you don't do energy storage. And then in this scenario, it's exactly the same as the policy scenario, but I've just switched on the ability for Nemo to do um, storage. And that's really easy to do. Um, it's just there's one variable where you set the maximum capacity that you're allowed to build. In these, store, in these scenarios, I set it to zero for storage. And in this one, I just allow it to do as much as it likes. And then I finally, I've got one other scenario where I'm setting additional emission constraints. So I just want to see how Nemo will behave if I tell it it has to achieve much lower greenhouse gas emissions. So let's look at some of the results. I think I might need to open up this other one that I've already um, pre-calculated because I think I was making some changes there. Okay, so let's try and look at some results. So the first one I want to show you is, is the overall electricity demand. So here's the electricity demand in the baseline scenario. So you can see it's, um, it's just gradually growing over time. It's not doing much efficiency. Um, um, and all of the sectors are growing. You know, it's, it's, like, it's sort of like a, um, a rapidly developing middle income country, something like that. Let's look at the policy scenario though, which is a bit different. So the policy scenario, you can see, first of all, uh, the, the growth in the household sector is much lower than it was in the baseline scenario. That's because I've done a lot of energy efficiency investments. I'm doing all sorts of um, um, much more efficient air conditioners, more efficient lighting, things like that. So that brings down the demand. But on the other hand, 
I've said, let's switch from gasoline to electric vehicles. So let's look at what would be implied by having lots more electric vehicles. That causes a big growth in electricity. Okay, so that's the total annual demand over time. But what does that look like within each year? So let's look at a different chart now that looks at the time slices. Um, so that's this one here. I can see I'm running out of time rapidly. So here you can see, for example, for the different sectors, how the demand varies within time. So you can see here, for example, there's big peaks in the summer uh, in the household sector. If I zoom in on the household sector by kicking up here, you can see a lot of that's caused by this air conditioning. So really big peaks in the baseline due to the air conditioning. But if we do our policies scenario, it's much less, right? It's because we've invested in efficient air conditioning. So we've brought down the peak, the overall load shape. It's still very peaky, but it's much less peaky than it was before. Or if we look for the sector as a whole though, here's our household sector, but now we've got this big growth in the orange one, which is the, which is the, um, the transport sector. So that's sort of the electric vehicles growing over time. Okay, so, how are we going to meet that demand over time? Well, so let's look at a different variable here. Let's look at the power generation over time. So here's our baseline again. So the power generation over time, you can see um, Nemo has chosen different plants and it uses different plants in different time slices in order to uh, identify the sort of minimum cost of, of providing the electricity. So you can see here it's using solar during the day when solar is available. So in LEAP, you can set the availability of your power plants to, to be uh, different in different seasons and different times of day. So the solar is available during the day. The wind varies as well, but more by season rather than by, by the day. And then, so it's using the wind and solar when it can. It's also using some existing hydro that it had lying around. And then in the end, it's using the natural gas. So it has to fire up the natural gas a lot to meet the peak demand. Okay, so let's look at the, polis uh, the, the policies, but with storage now, and you'll see it's very different. So here now, we're trying to meet our, our demand, but we've allowed Nemo to build some storage. So you can see here, instead of um, having to use nearly as much natural gas, now it can rely on storage. So there's some time slices of the year when there's lots of solar or wind available, when it puts electricity into the battery or into the storage. And then there's other times of the year when, when, when it can use that storage to help meet the peak demand. So overall, it ends up using the purple, the natural gas, much less than it did in the other scenarios. So that's a much more sort of realistic um, simulation of uh, what you might need to do to, to get to sort of much lower um, emissions pathways and to make use of storage and to make use of energy efficiency. Um, so let's see. So I think that's uh, about what I wanted to show you. Oh yes, no, there's one, one other very quick thing. Um, what does that mean in terms of your emissions? So let's just look at one more chart, the greenhouse gases. By the way, I'm, I'm using the favorite charts feature in Leap here. So I'm quickly switching between different charts just the, because time is so limited here. Okay, so here's the overall emissions in 2050 from these different scenarios. So you can see the baseline scenario had much higher emissions. When we went to the policy scenario, we dramatically reduced those emissions in part because we were doing lots of electrification and lots of energy efficiency. So there's no gasoline vehicles anymore. You know, they've been replaced by electric vehicles in this orange bar. Um, but then the policies with storage let you go even lower in part because you're making use of the storage, you don't have to dispatch the natural gas as much to meet your peak demand. So you're getting rid of the, the dispatch of the dirtiest plants. So it helps you squeeze the emissions down even further. And then the emission constraints scenario is like the policies with storage scenario, but it's just squeezing even further. So it's making even greater use of storage and wind and solar in order to meet the overall demand. So there you have it. That's a quick demonstration of how you can use three of Leap's new features, uh, the flexible time slicing, the demand side load shapes, and the NEMO optimization framework to examine policies for a transition to low greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I should say that this demonstration data set, this fictitious demonstration data set, will make that available and distribute it along with Leap 2020. So you can all play around with this data set yourselves. Okay, so that's that part of the demonstration. 
I'm going to switch over now and hand over to Sylvia, who's going to tell you about um, MAC curves and decomposition. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Charlie. Let me share my screen now. Okay, so I will give you a very quick demonstration of two new types of analysis and visualizations that are available in LEAP 2020. And you can access both of them in the summaries view in LEAP. So the first one that I will show you is the MAC curves or the marginal abatement cost curve report. The MAC curves are a very useful tool for comparing the costs and the abatement potential of various mitigation options, which are usually very context specific. So this tool is very helpful for policymakers to prioritize which measures to pursue and to prioritize those that are the most cost effective and the most ambition, ambitious ones. So as you can see in this example, the MAC curves are comprised of a series of blocks. Each one of these blocks represents an individual measure, which has also been modeled as a separate scenario in LEAP. So here in the legend, you can see a very short description of the mitigation measures that are being considered in this example. And for each block, the width of the block indicates the avoided emissions. So the widest bars represent those measures that have the highest abatement potentials. And on the other hand, the height of each bar indicates the incremental cost per unit of emission reduction. So in the chart, the blocks are ordered from left to right according to their cost. So at the left, you can see those measures that are the most cost effective ones, which could even have net cost savings if they appear below the, the X axis. And to the right, you can find the measures that have the higher cost. So how to read this? For example, if we look at the electric vehicles, you'll see that this policy has a unit cost of about 50 US dollars per ton. You can also see this in the table view, which makes it easier to see the actual numbers. And it has a potential of around 25 million tons of CO2 equivalent. The chart also gives you the average cost, which is displayed as a line. So actually the area enclosed by this line and the X axis represents the cumulative cost of implementing all of these measures. Now you'll see that in this example, most of the measures are from the demand side. So they are related to changes in technology in the household, in the transport and in the industrial sector mainly. However, implementing measures in the supply side or in the transformation sector can also have an impact on the cost or the potential of demand side measures. So to explore that, let's go back to the analysis view and we will now add a scenario in the supply side. So in the list of scenarios, you'll see that I have already added a scenario here for the power sector, which considers a shift towards a more renewable power generation matrix and also a reduction in the transmission and distribution losses. So what I'll do is that I'll select the scenario from the list and tick here where it says including MAC report. And now we will go back and see how that changed the MAC curve. But before going back, I'll just mention that because of the way in which LEAP generates the MAC curves, it is only possible to include individual scenarios. So that means that this mitigation scenario, for example, which inherits all of these individual measures, cannot be included as such in the MAC curve. So even if you tick here, you will get an error message when you go back to the summaries view. So now let's go back to the summaries view. And every time that you change something in the data set, we need to manually refresh the MAC curve. And this is because LEAP generates these MAC curves using a retrospective approach. So what LEAP is doing now is that it is calculating all of the scenarios to identify which one is the most cost effective one. Then it plots that one first at the left of the chart, like I showed you before, and then it recalculates all of the remaining scenarios, but this time assuming that the first one has already been implemented. And this is very important because it is what lets LEAP consider possible interdependencies between different options. So for example, how a supply side measure can have an impact on the demand side and vice versa. So here it's now refreshed. And you will see in the chart view that this measure that we just implemented for the power sector is now the one with the highest abatement potential. 
and that actually implementing this measure had an impact on other demand side measures. So if we look again at the electric vehicle policy, this one, let's see it in the table view, you'll see that it now has about seven times the abatement potential that it, that it did before when it was implemented in a more carbon intensive um, system. And the cost is about one fifth of what it was before. So it's now a much more cost effective policy. So this is just an example of how um, LEAP can consider these interdependencies between different options. The MAC curves in LEAP are highly customizable. So through this manage summaries button, you can add additional MAC curves and have each one with different settings. You can update the settings here. For example, you can change which scenario to be used as the counterfactual or which branches in LEAP should be used um, to represent the cost and the impact. And for example, instead of looking at GHG emissions, you might be interested in looking at um, or ranking policies um, based on their potential to reduce other types of pollutants. So you might want to look into black carbon or particulate matters or other types of, of pollutants. So you can apply different filters available in LEAP to create such a, a report. I already saved one for the particulate matters. So let me show you that one. And you can see here how the same list of measures may rank very differently. And some measures, for example, reducing open burning of waste might not be so important for reducing the GHGs, but it definitely has a lot of potential for reducing particulate matter. So this is something interesting to analyze when you're trying to prioritize um, mitigation measures. Now, the second report that I will show you is the decomposition analysis. And this one you can also find here in the summaries view. Um, this type of report can help you analyze the trends in scenarios by decomposing those trends into various contributing factors. Um, and LEAP does that based on the IPAD and the Kaya identity methodologies. You can learn more about those methodologies here in the, lab, in the uh, help system within LEAP. But in general, the default report that is included in LEAP and breaks down the trend in the GHG emissions, which is the indicator shown here in the y-axis. The first column right here shows the starting value in 2010 for GHG emissions, and the last bar shows the value in 2040. So you'll see there was an increase in the emissions over time. And all of these intermediate bars represent those contributing factors that explain this trend. So in this case, there's the population, there's the GDP per capita, there's the final energy consumption per unit of GDP, and the primary energy per unit of final energy consumption, and both of these are a measure of energy intensity. And finally, there's the um, emissions per unit of energy, which is a measure of the carbon intensity. The colors in this chart indicate whether each of these uh, factors contribute to an increase or to a decrease in the indicator. So here in the baseline, you'll see how there was an increase in the population in the GDP per capita, which is a measure of um, wealth and in the carbon intensity, but there was a decrease in the energy intensity. Now, besides from comparing two years for a single scenario, you can also change the view and you can change and you can compare two different scenarios for a given year. So for example, in 2040, here we have the baseline and the mitigation scenario. So you'll see that in the mitigation scenario, which had all of the measures that we saw before in the MAC curve, there were lower emissions in 2040. And this was as a result of a further reduction in the energy intensity and in the carbon intensity you'll see that the population and the GDP per capita didn't have an effect or didn't contribute to this decrease in emissions because they were the same in both scenarios. You can also see this report as a bar chart. So you can see for each year what was the corresponding contribution of each of these factors. And just like the MAC curves, you can add additional reports and you can edit in this case, you can change which are the contributing factors and you can change also what is the ultimate indicator that you're trying to analyze or to explain. So again, you could um, 
select here black carbon, other type of pollutant, or even um, premature deaths if you are using the, the LEAP IBC model, which is another feature here in LEAP. So I think this is all for now, and back to you, Charlie, so you can give the, the last demo. Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, so I'm going to do the last demonstration now. Uh, where I want to show you the new mapping features in LEAP. Um, so LEAP has for a long time allowed you to examine the annual average environmental loadings associated with your model, uh, including how those emissions might change over time as different sectors grow or different technologies and different policy measures are implemented. Um, and this is done using uh, the emission factors in LEAP, uh, which are specified uh, for different pollutants and for each technology uh, within the branch structure in LEAP. And we can see a couple of examples of that down here, um, a very simple example. So here, for example, we might have emission factors for uh, natural gas cookstove. We specified a, a whole uh, bunch of different factors, both for greenhouse gases, local air pollutants uh, and also short-lived climate pollutants. You can put all of those emission factors into LEAP. But LEAP 2020 goes further uh, by allowing you to specify not just the annual average um, emission factors but also the distribution of those uh, emission factors geographically. Um, <clears throat> And it also allows you to explore how that how those geographic distributions might change over time um, as as things change in your scenario as different sectors grow but also as you pursue different policies and in, as well as calculating those uh, emissions distributions leap 2020 also lets you view the results on uh, gis based maps um, so our hope is that this new feature will be useful in helping to identify uh, uh, emerging emission hotspots, as well as for tracking and monitoring progress on reducing the emissions burdens faced by different communities. So that's becoming an increasingly important topic as issues of environmental justice are discussed in the debate about um, planning sustainability transitions. Um, so let me show, I'm going to show you some of those new elements now, but before I do that, let me just say a lot of the way that we've implemented these new features in LEAP, they draw very heavily on a fairly amazing uh, uh, open source GIS component called MapWin GIS, uh, which is available from mapwindow.org. Um, so I just want to do a special thanks to the developer of MapWin. Mapwin GIS, Paul Memes, who gave me a great deal of assistance in implementing these features in LEAP. So let's have, have a look at how that works in LEAP. And we're going to start by looking at how to set up maps. So the first thing you need to do is to download and install the separate Mapwin GIS components. We will be providing links to those on the LEAP website once LEAP 2020 is launched in the next day or so. And once installed, LEAP should recognize MapWin GIS automatically. You don't have to do anything else. If you want to check to make sure that it's correctly installed, you can look at the About screen in LEAP and look for the entry that says MapWin GIS. So you can see here on my machine, it is installed correctly. That's all I have to do. I don't have to do any special things in LEAP to connect up to it. And now let's, so now let's look at how we set up the maps we're going to use in LEAP. Um, let's see, where am I? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is go back to the setting screen and enable the mapping feature. Um, so previously in LEAP, you could use maps, but they were restricted only to multi-regional data sets. Uh, but the new version of LEAP will support mapping both, uh, both in multi-regional and single region data sets. This particular one I'm gonna show you here is a multi-region data set but we're going to use this new feature to map results to a grid. Um, so that's the first thing we need to do is just simply enable that checkbox and then we can come over here and look at the mapping feature in LEAP. Um, and the, the mapping settings here are where we specify the name of a shape file. So a shape file is a standard um, GIS data file that can be used in all sorts of different um, GIS software. Um, there's some very good open source GIS, GIS software out there that you can use in conjunction with Leap. There's um, a package called QGIS, which is particularly good and free. 
Um, so here you're going to select a shape file that contains the outlines of, e of the, the, the countries that you're modeling in your data set. So here I've got this particular shape file is just uh, a shape file containing outlines of every country in the world. The labels are just the names of the, of the countries. So that's a field within the, the shape file. You can also specify a background image layer, although Leap will also um, create background images automatically by pulling them in from as uh, tiled images from the um, internet in much the same way as things like Google Maps do. And then finally, you need to specify the resolution of the gridding that you're going to do in your calculations and that you want to show in your map. So here I've specified 0.1 by 0.1 degrees, which is sort of fa fairly small, um, um, but works well for a small to medium country. Um, the smaller the size of the, the grid cell, the more memory will be required. So I would advise not going too small. Um, and also I'd probably advise using the 64-bit version of Leap, uh, which can handle much larger uh, uh, models and has much more memory available to it. Okay, so that's how we uh, set up the shapefile to be used with our mapping. This particular data set again is a multi-regional data set. And first of all, just a, um, a word of warning, even though it's set up to have three regions which are named as three countries, the data I'm going to show you here is, uh, is completely fictitious. This is not data for Bangladesh, Bhutan and Nepal. I'm just, I've just chosen those three at random just as a way of showing you some results on a, on a map file. But this is in no way should be interpreted as results for those countries. Um, okay, so the next step then is we go to the region screen. And here we have our three regions in our LEAP model, Bangladesh, Bhutan and Nepal. And over here on the right, we simply map each of those to a shape in the shape file. So the shape file you can see has basically every country in it. And I've just m matched up the names of the regions to the names in the shape file. So that creates the outlines that's going to be the base, the outlines of the countries that are going to be the basis for the mapping that we're doing. The next step is that we go to this brand new screen called the geographic mapping screen. So that's under the general menu. This is a brand new screen in Leap 2020. And on this screen, what you're going to be doing is creating a set of different uh, GIS uh, data files that contain socioeconomic data that you think are reasonable our reasonable basis for allocating the uh, emissions in your data set. So in this particular example, what I'm going to be doing, for, exam uh, for example, is taking the emissions coming from the household sector and allocating those within grid squares within each country. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say my emissions in are, are proportional to how many people live in each grid square. So my household emissions, I think, are proportional to the number of people. Similarly, I'm going to say my emissions from my transport sector are in proportion to the number of kilometers of road in each of the grid squares. So I think that's sort of a reasonable proxy variable that for simulating what the emissions might be. So again, we're only talking here about emissions. This current version of LEAP does not go beyond emissions. It's not going to, um, it's not going to allow you to model concentrations or impacts. Um, LEAP IBC, a separate model module within LEAP does do that, but at the moment, those two things are not connected. That's in the future, we hope to do that kind of thing. But for now, we're, we're only allowing you to do emissions with this feature. OK, so here I've got two different um, TIFF files. These are, my, these are my proxy data sets. And these kinds of files are available very freely on the internet. And if you click on the help file here, it'll actually list some common sources of, of, um, of um, uh, places where you can download these kinds of files. Um, here, for example, we've listed some examples of where you can go to get those kinds of TIFF files that contain these proxy socio socioeconomic data sets. These data sets don't have to be the same resolution as each other. So you can see here, one of them is point, point 0.1, one of them is point zero 0.04. Leap will take those data sets and it will rescale them to a, to a common scaling factor, the point 0.1 by point 0.1 that I chose. And 
then it will have a common basis for allocating the emissions to grid squares as it does its cal calculations. The only thing is each of these TIF files must cover all of the area that you're modeling in your LEAP model. So in this case, both of those data sets are global data sets, so they cover all of the countries that I'm interested in. Okay, once you've put in a set of data, uh, a set of data files, these proxy data files, you can use the, the regenerate button up here to build this sort of common, um, uh, common set of, um, of mappings that will be used as the basis for LEAPS calculations. I won't do that now because it doesn't require it. So here I've basically got two data sets, roads and population. Once you've done that, you then need to connect those up to your LEAP model to show how to, to do the allocation of the emissions. So down here you can see, for example, I'm under the household sector. I'm looking at natural gas stoves. I've already specified my emission factors under environmental loadings, but LEAP 2020 now has this new variable called geography, and that's the place where I'm going to allocate those emissions to grid squares. So here I'm allocating my household emissions on the basis of population, and it's using, you know, a lot, here are these different data sets I just created. So this one it's doing on the basis of population, but if I come down here under transport and look at my cars, you can see my cars are being allocated on the basis of that roads data set. So you could have lots of different proxy data sets and you could allocate different emissions in different sectors in different ways. And in fact, if I go down to transformation and look at electric generation down here somewhere, you can see here my geography variable is actually allocating things, just specifying these are point sources. So if you had a data set that had each individual power plant, you could simply put in the latitude and longitude of those power plants and it would allocate those emissions to the grid square within which that latitude and longitude resided. Okay, so that's the way you allocate the emissions in the data set. Once you hit calculate, LEAP's going to do its normal calculations, but it's also going to do an additional step where it allocates your total emissions out to each of the individual squares and those allocations might be different in different years and they might be different in different scenarios depending on the policies you pursue. So let's have a look at some results. Ah, so it needs to calculate this one. I'm not going to see if I've got ones already calculated. Just to save a bit of time here. Okay, so now we're going to look at some results. And here you can see, um, you know, in, we're in the results view in LEAP. We can look at our regular results just as we've done before. So here, for example, we're looking at the results by region for these, for our, the three regions of our model. And again, let me just emphasize, these are not real results. These are just sample results at this point. Um, we can look at um, different kinds of pollutants, um, or we can go, uh, but now we have the option to go and choose a new kind of chart that's a gridded map chart. So let me do that. Oh, hang on, let's go to the favorite. Uh, map chart, here we go. And you can see here now it's showing you the, the results uh, in the form of a map. And you can see the little blocks, each block corresponds to a, um, a square. Those are the cell sizes that we specified earlier. So the, the, these are the total emissions allocated out to the squares within the model. And you can see, uh, you know, the, there's quite a lot of variation depending on where the people are living, where the roads are, where the power plants are. It will actually show you different uh, levels of emissions. There's a, this works much like, it's a sort of simple version of a G, GIS software, and it works much like that. You have options for changing the colors, for changing the number of divisions, for changing where the background map comes from. Here, for example, I'm using the Bing hybrid maps, which is Microsoft's um, uh, mapping component. You can also use other ones. For example, there's the open humanitarian maps. It will pull those maps in uh, over the internet on the fly. You don't have to download them or anything like that. You can change the number of divisions or you can even change 
the basis on which it calculates the different divisions. So this here I'm showing equal count. We can do linear, log, and reverse log. Um, one particularly nice feature is to actually see what's going on within each grid square. So if I change this to a split view, here now you can see both the map, but also you can see the numbers corresponding to each individual um, cell on the map. And if I hold down the control key and hover over the map, it'll actually navigate within the table of values. And I can see there's one real peak value up here. Let's see what's going on up at this point. See if I can find that peak. Let me zoom in a bit so I can find it. So let's see if I can find that particular grid. So where was it there? Some, there's some very high numbers up here. And as we click on the different tables in the cell, it'll actually show you the trends within that one particular grid cell. So here you can see there's one point that's massively higher than the other points. So that's probably a cell that actually contains a power plant. And you can see the trends over time, the different scenarios for that particular grid cell. So there you go. That's just um, some of the things you can do with mapping. We're only just beginning to explore the kinds of things you can do with it, but I hope people will find that useful. Um, I'm particularly hopeful it will be a useful way of making um, development pathways much more relevant to individual communities and sort of enhancing discussions about what environmental justice means in terms of sustainable development pathways. Okay, so that's the mapping view. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, I just want to do a couple more slides just to talk you through some of the things that we haven't had a chance to mention. We haven't had a chance to show you all of the features. Um, so let's just mention some of those now. This one here. Okay. So there are also some other very important developments in LEAP 2020. Um, in particular, one thing I haven't had a chance to show you today because of lack of time is uh, some big enhancements to uh, the modeling of uh, air pollution impacts. So in, in particular, we now have the capability for looking at both indoor pollution and uh, ambient or outdoor pollution, as it's more properly called. Um, so LEAP has a new methodology based on the HAPIT tool, which was developed um, uh, by the uh, a, a Clean Cooking Alliance. Um, that a, that's a, allows you to look at the impacts of different cooking practices on the health of different members of society, whether it's uh, the, the women who are predominantly cooking in, in most societies or, or, ch or other adults and children. Our IBC model, which is the integrated benefits calculator, which is a tool for looking at the health and ecosystem impact of ambient air pollution has also been enhanced. That now allows you to look at results disaggregated by age and gender, um, which can be a very useful way of really bringing out some of the sustainable development uh, uh, benefits of uh, different energy policies. And it's been closely integrated with the uh, air pollution modeling um, aspects of LEAP 2020 as well. So um, integrated within the tool are ways of making sure that you're not double counting the impacts of uh, indoor versus outdoor air pollution because the two are very closely related. Um, aside from these new capabilities, we have also put a lot of work into LEAP to make to improve its usability and overall to improve the, the quality and the robustness of the tool. So even if you're not using some of these new features, we hope that you'll find LEAP 2020 to be easier to use and also much more robust uh, in everyday work. Finally, let me just say a, a few quick words about what's coming next and what we're planning over the next year or so. Um, so a, a, a big effort of work over the next year is to develop um, a new plug-in architecture for LEAP, um, which will support a more modular approach to the development of models. So at the moment, um, you know, myself in particular and other people at, at SEI can sometimes be the sort of bottlenecks in LEAP development. We're aiming to change the architecture of LEAP to support sort of more of a plug-in or modular architecture that should allow many more people to get involved in developing capabilities within LEAP. So that's the focus of this year. We're also working on how to make LEAP 
much more useful to people who are using it in teams. So increasingly people are doing that. In the past, people tend to use it individually, but now a lot of people, particularly those doing NDC development, are, are trying to use Leap in teams and we're tr uh, gonna be enhancing it to make that much more um, easy to do. Jason's already mentioned some of the um, enhancements going on in Nemo. So for example, allowing uh, Nemo to be used for energy system optimization, allowing it to be used for uh, network and power flow analysis. Those things are going to be sort of prototypes in Nemo and then we're intending to bring those things into Leap to make them more sort of broadly uh, usable by a wider group of people. And then finally, I should just mention that we, the SEI does have a new, a major new initiative on integrated climate and development planning. And through that initiative, we're trying to make use of, uh, we're trying to improve LEAP to make it much better able to uh, say things about macroeconomic and development implications of energy scenarios. So make it uh, much useful, much more useful for those trying to conduct uh, strategic planning of how to achieve the sustainable development goals, for example. So those are all things that will be a focus of our development over the next year or so. Okay, and that's, that's it for our presentations. And I think we have a few minutes now. We're slightly overrun running, but we, I think we, ha we can take five minutes now uh, for questions. And I'm gonna pass it over to Sylvia, who's been looking through what you've been posting in the Q&A. And let's see if there's any questions to answer. Over to you, Sylvia. Yeah, thank you everyone for your participation. We've had a lot of, of questions coming in the Q&A section. We've already answered quite a few, so you can all see the answers of the questions um, there for the ones that we've already um, published the answer. We still have a few open questions and other questions that came through the chat window. So um, there are several questions related to the MAC curves, Charlie. So maybe you can um, give a word on the methodology specifically there. Um, they are asking about how, um, how to rank the measures with negative costs in the MAC curves. And also um, where can they find some uh, Sorry, let me see what was exactly the question. Yeah, where can they find uh, further information on the methodology of mm -hmm. leap running through the scenarios to derive the MAC curves to consider the interdependencies? So maybe a word on the methodology for that would okay. be interesting. Okay, well, I can say something about that unless you want to, Sylvia. No, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so, so yeah, leap uses um, uh, a sort of standard approach for looking at MAC curves and it's more or less similar to what's known as the retro retrospective systems analysis approach. So it's basically doing multiple passes through, through its um, calculations and each pass is looking at which is the cheapest scenario. So the very, so first of all, you set up your counterfactual scenario, your baseline scenario, and then it says which of the policies and measures are the cheapest, that's the one it plots, plots first. Then it does another part. So in order to do that, it has to calculate all the scenarios and work out which is the most cost-effective scenario. So which has the lowest, typically it would be, which has the lowest cost per unit of emissions reductions. Then it'll do, then it'll take that scenario out of the mix and it will calculate all the other scenarios and say, okay, given that I've implemented one measure, what's the next cheapest scenario? So that's why it's called a marginal abatement cost curve. You know, it's looking at which scenario on the margin is cheapest, assuming you've calculated all the other scenarios. So that's really sort of a very standard way of, of, of uh, doing MAC curves, but it's known as the retrospective systems analysis approach. Uh, there's lots of description of that uh, within, within LEAP itself. If, you, if you're on the MAC curve screen and you press the help button, it will tell you all about that. Um, it also has links to other pages. There's lots of documentation about um, uh, Mac curves out on the internet and it links you into many of those pages to get you started thinking about that. Um, but as, as Sylvia said, you know, it goes a bit beyond standard Mac curves in that you don't have to just look at um, CO2 abatements. You can look at any different kind of pollutant. You could even look at, you know, what's the marginal abatement of avoiding premature mortality, which we haven't done so far, but be a very interesting analysis, I think. So that's the way it works. And I, I would say, when in doubt, start by pressing the F1 
function key and looking at the help pages because the new version of Leap has a huge number of uh, um, huge amount of documentation and it's all very context sensitive. So there's probably 300 pages of help built into Leap. So please, please take a look at it. Anything else, Sylvia? Thanks. Yeah, there are other questions. Um, maybe I will address two. <laughs> um, they're asking about the load shapes. So if the load shapes are available in the library and if they can be applied to different countries and also if the storage technologies are also available in the library. So those are two questions that are related. Should I take that? Yeah. Yeah. So um you have to import those uh, load shapes into leap leap doesn't have a built-in library itself but i could certainly uh in give you pointers to where you can get some of those uh load shapes there are a lot of resources out there on the internet um that data set i showed you earlier i made i made just in a matter of a day or two by finding some good sample load shapes uh on the internet and in, in, uh, importing them the extent to which you could use them across countries, you have to be a little bit careful with that, I think. You know, certainly wind and solar availability will de depend greatly on uh, the country context, but so might usage of different end uses. You know, there's some cultural factors implied about when people might uh, do cooking or lighting. So they're not necessarily transferable between countries, but it's very easy to import them into Leap. Or you, you literally just need a you know 8760 points which correspond to every hour in the year you and you can import it in just a matter of a second or two you can import a load shape into leap from excel i didn't show that for now but there's it's very easy to do that very good maybe another more general question is if there is any if there are any built-in features in leap to analyze the sdg7 goal which is the affordable, reliable, and modern energy for all, but maybe you can just comment on how these new features can be used to analyze SDGs. Sure, yeah, I mean, really LEAP is from the bottom up structured around thinking about energy, not as a, not, not in and of itself, but sort of energy is something that people need in order, you know, to, it meets their needs. So it's very, it's a very need driven, um, framework for thinking about energy so that makes it very suitable for thinking about sort of SDGs so you can think about um, you know if you can start talking about issues like people's need for cooking or lighting or air conditioning and you can say how that might change over time if uh, you know you have different people people at different income levels you have population growth so it's really very well set up for thinking about um, how society's needs for energy might evolve over time and what are the implications of trying to meet those needs, you know, if we pursue different policies for encouraging clean cooking, for example. And with the new developments on indoor air pollution, you can see how that might translate into impacts. So not just SDG 7, but the SDGs that deal with um, gender, for example. So now we can start to talk about the impacts of different clean cooking transitions on uh, women and children, which is really, sort of really important for thinking about SDG goals. And with the new emissions mapping capabilities, people can start to analyze, you know, how are different communities going to be affected by different energy strategies? So I'm teeing up all these new features, but you know, the you, you the users out there are the ones who are going to have to go and apply this to think about these policies. So we've just done a little bit of the work, but there's a lot of work still to do. Sylvia? Um, yes, another question is about the mapping. So um, if there is a way to input multiple latitude and longitude information for different power plants. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, and maybe about the future plans for LEAP, there are two questions. One if, is if there are other uses of GIS in LEAP that are being considered. And another one is if there are plans in the future to link LEAP with some IPCC software. Um, I would say we've only just scratched the surface in terms of the sort of the GIS capabilities, but 
Um, so yes, there's lots of new things we could do. It sounds like the person who asked that question has has some ideas in mind. So I hope they will um, send me an email and tell me what they're thinking because maybe we can think about it together. So yeah, there's there's lots more things we could do with the G, with the GIS capabilities. I think probably our, our next my my thoughts about what to do next with that would be to better connect it up to the IBC module so that we can not just plot emissions on a map but also plot concentrations um, and also start to think about whether impacts could be um, geographically disaggregated so things like the sort of the premature mortality figures and things like that we haven't got that far yet but that would be the, the next step but if you've got other ideas, please, you know, get, get in touch with me because we've only done so much so far. And then in terms of whether we could connect it up to the IPCC software, I guess the person there is talking about the IPCC inventory software. Um, I think we could, yeah, they're, they're actually quite different tools in the sense that the inventory software is for um, looking at just emissions in a base year, whereas LEAP is a sort of a forward looking scenario based tool. So quite often you have to do things in more detail in LEAP because you want to look at how emissions might be affected by different policies and how that impacts on different technologies. So quite often you have to go down to a more detailed level. But I think it certainly would be very interesting to uh, build a bridge between them and to build a connection. Um, we haven't done that yet, but we would certainly be interested in that. We have another question. Uh, they're asking, maybe this could be for you or for Jason, I'm not sure. Um, Viknesh is saying, it would be great to have comparative chart regarding computational times for model solving. Um, I understand ah. that this is dependent on the solver type. However, it would be great to see the computation advantage of using Julia-based models. Okay, well, I can just say a quick word, but I think Jason knows more about this than me. So. It, obviously, it's going to really depend on what particular model you're you're calculating. You know, if, if you have more branches in your data set, more time slices, uh, more years, that, that could all have an impact on how the solver take, how long the solvers take. But in general, we found that um, for really small, trivial models, then then the older solve, then the older framework osmosis is a little bit faster but you know there we're talking about you know two seconds versus three seconds that kind of thing nemo is still also very fast but for any sizable model any sort of real analytical model that you might want to do in a real world i think then nemo i think is going to be quite a bit faster than um os the older osmosis framework and then in terms of the solvers glpk and cbc the, f the free solvers are great but they they're very slow for very large models. Cplex, I was doing a test of that. The last model I was just showing you, the, the time slicing one, it solves in about 20 seconds on Cplex and it solves in about 900 seconds in uh, uh, GLPK. So, you know, you kind of get what you pay for with, with solvers. Jason, do you want to add anything on that? Sure, I will. Thanks, Charlie. Right, so I appreciate this question very much. We've, we did specifically choose Julia for its performance and we've really done a lot of work to try to get the best performance out of that platform. Charlie's absolutely right about model complexity and the choice of solvers driving important differences in calculation times. I'll also point out that we have a section on the NEMO, in the NEMO documentation with performance tips for any given modeling application, how to get the best performance out of NEMO. And as far as uh, benchmarks or or a comparison of different model runtimes. We, we haven't done that yet in a, in a systematic way. We've done some anecdotal work, but I think that would be an interesting thing for us to publish. And, um, and I think we can certainly take a look at that. Great, thanks, Jason. Sylvia, I think we've probably run over quite a bit here, so we should probably wrap it up. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah. we'll, we'll try to um, answer any of the other um, questions that we haven't got to now and we'll make those available. I think that will probably be on the LEAP Facebook page. So just before I wrap it up, let me just say, well, first of all, thank you for so many people for coming. We had a huge turnout here in addition to the huge turnout we had yesterday. So thanks to everyone for their enthusiasm. Um, Leap, the Leap, Leap 2020 itself will be available in the next day or two. Um, I've got a few, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to prioritize things a little bit here, but it's basically ready to go and we'll be uploading it on the web, website with, within the next 48 hours, I think I could say. Um, 
in terms of the presentations, yes, we'll also be making those available on the uh, LEAP website and the LEAP Facebook page. And the sample data sets that we showed, um, we'll also be making those available as well so that you can play around with those in LEAP once you've downloaded it. Um, so I think it only remains for me to say thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks for such a uh, enthusiastic set of questions that you posted and I hope you will give Leap 2020 a try and let us know what you think as well. Um, give us your feedback on it because you know really the, the changes we make to it going forward are very much uh, based on the feedback we get from users and the new features that users request. So please do give us your feedback. Tell us if you're having any problems but tell us also which features you do and don't like. So thanks for, thanks for coming everyone and hope to see you again shortly. Bye for now.